God, we glorify, magnify thee because you are the God of love. You are the one who has saved us. You are the one who has delivered us from the powers of the enemy. And you are the one who can keep us to the very end. As we come together now, we pray that you speak to our hearts. And give us the grace to be obedient children of yours. So that at the end of it all, the words we are hearing will not stand against us on the day of judgment in Jesus' name. And while life remains, O oh Lord, the grace to be a blessing to our generation, give unto us in Jesus' name. That which we do not know, teach us, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. I welcome you to the worship service today in Jesus' name. Uh, today we are going to be looking at the Word of God together and uh, follow up on our teaching uh, of the search the scripture. We look at the responsibilities within the family and uh, we saw the duties and the responsibilities of parents to children and children to parents. Uh, we are now going to look into another aspect of uh, fellowship another aspect of relationship, and that is the mission and the ministry of the church. The mission and the ministry of the church. Why the church? What is the meaning of the church? What is the purpose of the church? Who forms the church? All this we are going to consider together. And I'm here to let us know that the church is a divinely constituted body through which the gospel of Christ is preached and through which every believer within the body is matured. The church is the group of people that are called out, called out of the world, called out of sin, called out of the worldly society. The church is a group of people called out of self, called unto Christ, called out from the darkness of the world into the light of the Lord, called out from the ruins of this age to the reigns of Christ. So then, the church it's not just a gathering of people that are businessmen. The church is not just a gathering of professionals together. The church is not just a gathering of community people, townspeople. The church is not a gathering of political gathering together. The church is the assembly of people that are saved from their sin. People that are redeemed by the power of the Lord. And that is why the reasoning of the church, the thinking of the church, the actions of the church cannot, must not, should not be equated with the way and manner the people of the world do things. In the worldly community, in the communal environment, majority carries a vote. Just like in politics, in the church, God leads his church. I say God leads his church. And so, the church is not by the opinion of man or dictates of anyone. The church submits to the order of God in heaven if we are children of God. So then, to be a member of the church, not just a physical gathering, you want to be sure that you are genuinely saved, free from sin. There is no way you can still be living in sin and claim to be a member of the church. You may be a member of the physical gathering, but when we talk of the church, it goes beyond the physical gathering. The church goes beyond just the four walls of the building. This church, a place called church, where we are today, we say this is a church, but this is just a building. This same building can be used for something else later on. And pay attention, if you say you're a member of the church, the moment you stop living the life of God, you, 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 you cease to become or to remain 
a member of the church of God. So then, to be a member of the church, your life must be holy, righteous, upright, and acceptable in the sight of the Lord. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, let's open our Bible and see what the Word of God has to say to you and to me from the Holy Word of God concerning this subject. Matthew chapter 16, I'm looking at it from the 18th verse, and I say unto you, unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Upon this rock of truth, the rock of righteousness, the rock of holiness, the rock of purity, the rock of uprightness, I will build my church. I will build my people. I will build my children. And the Bible says that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. When you are a member of the family of God, when you are a true child of God, not just that you come to a physical fellowship, but you have fellowship with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Lord is saying that the gates of hell, the forces of darkness, the powers of darkness, principalities and powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places, no matter what they do, they will not prevail against you. I said they will not prevail against you. That is why you don't want to just come to church like people go to any other church where they just gather together. You want to be a true member of the body of Christ that deep down within your soul, there is that assurance of genuine conversion. There is that a deep confirmation of your personal relationship with God so that no matter the wind that is blowing, because winds do blow, no matter the storm that is raging, because storms do rage, your faith is firm in the Lord. I say your faith is firm in the Lord. So it's not because whether I am sick today that will determine my relationship with the Lord. Whether I have job, whether I have money, whether I have people supporting me or people against me, none of all those. Paul said, who then shall separate us from the love of Christ? He said, shall tribulation Shall uh, famine? Shall he said? Even said, not even death, not even death, not the news of death, not the sight of death will separate us from the love of Christ, love of God which is in Christ Jesus, and the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter twelve. I'm looking at verses twenty-two and twenty-three. Hebrews chapter twelve. But ye are come unto Mount Zion. And unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Can you see your calling? That you have been called into a higher fellowship, a higher relationship, a higher congregation, not just with the physical alone, but with the heavenly, verse 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge and, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. So, we are expected to live a life that is acceptable unto God, a life that conforms with the will of God, conforms to the will of God, and uh, he will keep us. He will help us. He will guide us in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 16, verse 1. Romans 16, verse 1. I commend unto you, Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at uh, St. Crea. He's saying that there are people that are in the church, but they're not servants of the church. They are not laborers in the church. They are not people that make sacrifices for the church. I pray that heaven will count us worthy in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostle, chapter 14. Acts of the Apostle, chapter 14. I'm looking at the 23rd verse there. Acts 14, 23. 
Acts 14, 23. Over here in verse 23 of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14, the Bible says in that passage, and when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord of whom they believed. Can you see the relationship between the church and the Lord? the church, and the people that are being called into ministry. And so, understand the fact that we, as members of the church together, should not forsake the assembly of ourselves together, as the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. But exhorting one another in so much the more as you see the day approaching. The day of the coming of the Lord is very, very near. But you know there are people today, instead of coming to a congregation like this and fellowshipping with men of like passion, with men of like faith, they say they stay at home. They want to listen to television at home. They want to listen to radio at home. But the Bible says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. And the Lord will help us to be members of the true fellowship of Christ in Jesus' name. I will look at three points. Number one, as we look at this, these points are telling us the mission and the ministry of the church. Number one mission and the ministry of the church is the preaching and the teaching of the gospel. The preaching and the teaching of the gospel. Number two is the fellowship and the worship of the saints. The fellowship and the worship of the saints or by saints, whichever way you choose to put it. And finally, as we preach and teach the gospel, and then we fellowship one with another, then we mature the believers. Number three now, the maturity of believers within the church. The maturity of believers within the church. So, number one is the preaching and the teaching. Number two is the fellowship and the worship. And finally, maturity of believers. Let's come to that uh, first one. What's the first thing? The preaching and the teaching of the gospel. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Matthew chapter 28. And understand, I told us already that as a church, we have a duty and responsibility towards ourselves and towards the members of the body of Christ. Matthew 28, from verse 18. There the Bible says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me. In heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe how many things? All things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you, how often? Always, even unto the end of the world. And the church says, Amen. So here we see the instruction from the Lord, the command from the Lord for us to go and teach all nations, all nations, all that Christ himself has commanded us. And please understand, when he said we should go and teach all nations, all that he has commanded us, then it is not our choice to pick and choose what we are going to preach and what we are going to teach. We preach and teach the totality of the gospel, whether it is convenient for man or not convenient for man, whether it is accepted or rejected by anyone, we preach everything. And whether man, men accuse us or admit us, we preach everything, understand you are a servant, and servants do the biddings of their master. So you have no choice to pick and choose. I have no choice to pick and choose. And we cannot, for whatsoever reason, water down the gospel of Christ and then make it so uh, 
easy for people in such a way that they neglect and ignore and abandon the main essential part of the gospel. What I'm saying is this. We come to people like many people do, and they just say God is good. God is love. If you come to Jesus, he will, he will put butter on your bread. If you come to Jesus, he will promote you. If you come to Jesus, he will bless you. Yes, he will do all of those, but we also need to remind the people that God is a consuming fire. I said God is a consuming fire. We need to let people know that there are conditions for living that life and enjoying those lives and enjoying those benefits because it is when we are holy, righteous, and upright that those things will come unto us. Not just that, okay, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus, and then your life of lying is still there. I believe in Jesus, your life of immorality is still there. I believe in Jesus, your stealing is still, is still there. You heard the, uh, one of the minister that was uh, Andre answering the question and answer uh, earlier on that when he said that where he used to work that uh, once he signed in other people feel bad and terrible well should he not because of what they feel what they think then discipline life their sinful life change his own conviction change his own position the answer is no the answer is no we don't live to please man and so we live to please the lord in everything that we do, and God will give us the grace in Jesus' name. God will grant us the enablement to live a life that is unique and different. Let your light so shine before men that they may see and glorify your Father which is in heaven. If all you do in your life is to just please everybody and then preach what they want you to preach, not what God wants you to preach. And if all you do in your life is just make people happy, applaud you, and say, yes, that is our pastor, at the end of the day, God will say, I know you now. There is time for everything. There is time to make people feel comfortable. There is a time to make them feel uncomfortable. There is a time to tell them blessings are coming. There is also a time to tell them causes are coming. There is a time to Gather, there is a time to disperse. Understand the signs of the time and what God wants you to do. To do. And do it well. And God will help you in Jesus' name. So, as you go about preaching the gospel, preach the totality of the gospel. There are a lot of people out there now. And uh, they are actually more than 90% that are preaching eternal security. Once saved, forever saved. But you go there and tell them, the soul that sin it, I can't hear somebody. You go there and let them know that the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in them. You go there and tell them, even if you're the only one person in the midst of 100 people, or in the midst of 1,000 people, you let them know, the Bible says, be ye holy, for I, your God, I am holy. Let them know, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. That is the totality of the gospel. People don't want to hear that anymore. They tell you, you are judging them. And then they quote the Bible wrongly that the Bible says, thou shalt not judge. But the truth is, we are not the judge. The Bible judges already. The Bible judges their sin. The Bible judges their life. Their conduct, their character, their behavior, their attitude. The Bible judges already. All we are doing is just saying, thus says the Lord. And we are under the command of the Lord to declare the totality of the word of God. Go ye therefore into all the nation and preach the gospel. Teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And we will do that in Jesus' name. And understand this is, this year is still pretty young. And the mandate is there for you and for me to go and preach the gospel anywhere we go. You know, some people, they don't like coming to a church like us. They say that we are fire and brimstone uh, preaching church. Well, if that's what they call us, praise God. Check up your Bible. Jesus preached about hell more than any other subject in the Bible. So, why then should we be intimidated because they say uh, we are too hard, we are too difficult. We are not hard and difficult. We are just trying to prepare men for heaven. 
Because it is better to get the truth now than to know it when it is too late. Because there is no repentance in the grave. So, understand the mission of the church, the ministry of the church, the calling of the church. We are not just uh, a communal gathering. We are not just uh, a political gathering. We are a church on a mission. I thought I would hear a better amen. And we should do what we have been called to do, and we'll do it well in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter, uh, sorry, Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. I look at it from verse 15. Mark 16 from verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Uh, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And this sign shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents and and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. I need their name and name. They shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. So when after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs following. And the church says... It will happen again. We'll do the biddings of the master. We'll obey the commands of our commander. And the blessings of obedience will come upon us in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostle, Acts of the Apostle, chapter 2, the preaching and the teaching of the gospel. Acts of the Apostle, we're looking at uh, the second chapter there. And then we look at the 42nd chapter. And you see that the preaching of the gospel from the time of the scripture is linked to and with conversion, with salvation. Verse 42, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Let me back up to verse 1. Then they that gladly receive his word were baptized, those that were born again were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer and in prayer and in prayer. This is part of the ministry of the church, the ministry of preaching, the ministry of teaching, the ministry of praying. And then we do all this together in obedience. We do all this together in unity. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And the doctrines of the apostles are the doctrines of Christ handed down unto them. And they were obedient. And we, by the grace of God, will be obedient. We will do what the Lord has commanded us to do in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 5 verse 42. Chapter 5 of Acts of the Apostles, verse 42. And daily in the temple, not just anywhere, daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. They ceased not. They did not stop. No matter what is going on in the family, no matter what is going on on the job, no matter what's going on in the community, they did not stop. Persecution was there, they did not stop. Opposition was there, they did not stop. Punishment was there, cruelty was there, they did not stop. Whether in the church or whether in their home fellowship, like we call it the home caring fellowship, they did not stop, they did not change the standard of the word of God. And by the grace of God, we will follow after the steps of the apostles in Jesus' name. So, preaching is the recruiting and the motivating ministry of the church. And teaching is the maturing ministry. Understand? When we come on a Sunday like this, we preach the world. We preach the world. There are saved people here. There are unsaved people in the church. There are mature people. There are immature people. There are young people. There are old people. We try to 
preach a balanced message that we cut across everybody, whether they are children, uh, I was with the children's church, and then they taught, and then we got involved, we brought it down to their level, they all made their contribution, meaningful contribution, wonderful contribution, and uh, everybody felt blessed, and a number of them, they said, yes, I am ready to receive Christ into my life today, and that they did, and we blessed the Lord for that, we, and then in the adult church, we do the same thing, we Bring it to the level of everybody. Now, when we come for Bible study, that is now when you want to be coming. Uh, uh, where, where, where now you are born, you want to be growing in grace. You want to be maturing in the faith. You want to become a better person. You want to school yourself so as to be able to be a blessing to your generation. Then we are not take line upon line, precept upon precept, the teaching of the Bible. We call it Bible study. But you know some people, they come to church on Sunday. Bible study, you don't see them. The last one month, the last one year, you don't see them at a Bible study. Which church do you go to? Deeper Life Bible Church. Well, why telling them you go to Deeper Life Bible Church? Remember to tell them that you are also Sunday, Sunday worshiper. That you are not one of those that is really growing and maturing in the faith. Teaching them. Teaching them. You preach to them and now you bring them together and teach them all things whatsoever. There are some hard things that we don't teach openly on Sunday. Bible study, we get into the nitty gritty of that. Praise the Lord. And then, we now have another session. When you are growing, you are maturing, you get to a point and you think, I think instead of me being a child, I'm now an adult in the faith. I want to serve the Lord. I want to be this and that for the Lord. You now say, I want to be a worker. Then you get more deeper things, more deeper things. And then you go through some training and you hear some top, top things because you are now a, a, a foot soldier, a grand soldier. You are now going to the battlefield. You are now going to win and conquer for the Lord. And your level is now at a different horizon. You are not the low level person you used to be. You are not just the medium level person. You are now at a higher level because now you are going with ammunition fully armed, going in the battle for the Lord, and God will qualify you. But then, understand, Jesus said, without me, you can do how many things? You can do nothing. And so we say, come again. You were there on Sunday. We praise God. We saw your face. We thank God you are always committed to coming. And then Bible study, you, even though it is not convenient, you have to go to work. You finish from work. You are running back down to the church. You, you, are, you are in the fellowship of the believer all the time. You are encouraging people. They are encouraging you. And then we now say, hey, it's not enough. It's not enough. The letter kill it, but the spirit gives life. Come for prayer meeting. And then when we come for prayer meeting, we call it revival service. You know, people People don't understand the meaning of revival. They think it's just all this jamboree thing that people do. Revival service is when you really soak yourself in the, in the power of prayer. Revival service is when you really get deeper and begin to launch out into the realm of the spirit. Revival service is when you equip yourself and surround yourself with the, with, with the angels of the Lord by the power of prayer. Revival service is a time where you dispel all the force and powers of darkness. Revival service is when you show the source of the people, the heart of the people in prayer, people think we revival service only one say, eh, you are having headache. We want to pray for you. You are having a kwa choko. We want to pray for you. And if you don't talk of headache, you don't talk of kwa choko, you don't talk about a demon, uh, you come to church and let us say and read a place like uh, Ephesians chapter 6, what verse? Uh, uh, not uh, okay. That means you are not used to it. Verse ten, Amen. And then you get to verse twelve, and then you go all the way. The weapons of our warfare uh, are not carnal, that uh, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Uh, and we war not against the flesh, uh, but against the spirit. Uh, and then we talk about uh, a spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, and then every devil, every demon. And then you see how we pray. But when we now say, Oh God, this Christian life. The grace to live it and to serve it to the end. Give it unto me. Let us pray. You see, people, you, know, you won't hear their voice again. What would it be? Oh, God. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. 
But when you say, let us cast out the devil, in the name of Jesus, I bind the devil, take it easy. Be matured. We do that for the sake of the immature people. Somebody say amen. For do, but for those that are matured, if God be for us, please have understanding. Who can be against us? Understand, as a mature believer, the angel of the Lord encamp round about them that fear the Lord. Amen? understand as a believer you are living a righteous life a holy life a pure life you don't need that and once again openly for the sake of those that are weak in faith that are looking for me yes we we'll do that but you that are matured you walk in the majesty of god in your life you walk with the grace and the power of the holy ghost so knowing fully well that you are untouchable i say you are untouchable amen and so when we come together and we say, let us pray, and I see some people that have been in the faith for 20 years, for 30 years, they are still praying and still acting as if they are a young believer. Well, no problem. Pray your prayer. We just understand where you belong. Praise the Lord. Amen. And so, but when we come together and we say, let us deal with spiritual issue, we deal with spiritual issue. Because the enemy does not want you to make it to the end. The Bible tells us that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and only the violent will take it by force. He will grant us the kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, through the preaching, new babes are being brought into the family of God. But through the teaching, the babes are matured from milk to strong meat. That is the mission and the ministry of preaching and teaching in the church. I get to the second point. What's the second point? Fellowship and worship of the saints. The fellowship and worship of the saints. Acts of the Apostle, we read it before. The Bible tells us that they, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Chapter 2, verse 42. It says there, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. In the doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread and in prayer. Now, some people pay attention here. They come to church. They love the church. They love the world. But once they walk through the door, they sit and get everything. They walk outside of the door. There is no connection between them and anybody. There is no relationship between them and anybody. The Bible says that is wrong. We get into the world. We get into fellowship. Fellowship is about relationship. Connecting with one another. And uh, maybe by the time we finish today, we are going to do an exercise. In case I forget, remind me. So that, uh, just say that exercise. So that we get to know one another. And the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. And he went further to say, breaking of bread. Where do you break bread? We break the bread in the church. We break the bread outside of the church. We break the bread from home to home. And uh, he also went for us to say, in prayer, we pray for one another. We are concerned about one another. We care for one another. And listen to this. Uh, the Bible tells us also in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4. I mentioned it so that you can get there on time. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4. It talks about ministering to the saints ministering to the saints. Pay attention here. If you are born again here, you are a saint. Amen. And we should be able to minister one to another. Just like parents in the family, they care for the children. The children, they obey the parents. Uh, they follow the instruction and the, the guidance of the parents. In the church, we care for one another. If you see somebody in need, we are there for them. And uh, as members together, as workers together, we are all there for one another. But in addition to that, pay attention. There are people here that does not understand what it means to minister to the saints. The saints in this context is the leaders in the church. 
the leaders in the church. And please pay attention. I'm not talking about me as an individual, but then it doesn't matter the leader in your fellowship, the leader in your group, how do we respect them? How do we appreciate them? How do we care for them? Some people, all they know in their life is to criticize the leader. All they know in their life is to condemn anything that is being done. They have no good idea. They have no good contribution. Instead of lifting up the spirit of the leader, they kill the spirit of the leader. And not that alone, while members of the church, pay attention here, while individual members of the church, they have need. They can talk, come to the church and say, I have this need. I have that need. Who do you expect your leader to go to? And if you don't know, I've told you before, by the time your leader, whether your pastor or your sectional leader, is coming to you begging for something, something is seriously wrong with the body. Amen? And I tell you as a leader, no matter what you are going through, you don't want your member to start begging for anything. Don't lower the standard of your calling. Don't destroy the anointing of God upon you. If God has called you, God will touch individual lives. They will come and meet your need in Jesus' name. Amen? Don't go to any member and say, can you borrow me $5 there? God is more than able. Don't trade your birthright for anything. Am I communicating? Don't give up the call of God upon your life. You may get that porridge, you may get that bread, and then your birthright is gone. That's what happened between Isaac, I mean, between Esau and Jacob. Don't give it up. You have been called for a purpose. And the one that called you will meet you at the point of your need. But for you as a church, pay attention, look around your leader and be a blessing unto them. Look around your leader. And be able to say, sir, ma'am, we appreciate you, we care for you, we love you, and this is what we are doing. Let's look at it now. Are you there? Second Corinthians, what chapter did I mention? Chapter 8, what verse? Verse 4. It says, praying us with much entreaty that we will receive, what's the next thing? The gift and take upon us the fellowship. Of the ministering to who? To the saints. What Paul the Apostle does is, when he goes around to churches, he remembers there are other senior apostles in Jerusalem. And Paul will tell them, we need to take care of our leaders. We need to take care of our, take care of our fathers in the faith. And Paul will collect offering and then we take to them and care for them. Let us care for our leaders as part of the ministry and the mission of the church. And God will help us in Jesus' name. You know, I wish I can preach this to all our members everywhere. Everywhere. So that the pastor here, the pastor there, the pastor there is not only laboring and laboring and laboring without being appreciated. And the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Please understand. Please understand. I'm not speaking for myself. There are people here that are doing what this, they, they, they know God is leading them to do. Amen? But I'm still speaking about other leaders. We have not just only one leader. And it doesn't matter how small your fellowship may be. And I'm saying even down to your home caring fellowship. And that's why I read to you the church. I read to you the house to house thing. Make sure while the leader there is struggling and striving that nobody lacks anything, you members there, be sure your leader does not lack anything. And God will take care of all of us all together in Jesus' name. He talks about ministering to the saints. First John, First John now, chapter 1, verses uh, 3, 6, and 7. First John, chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we we'll lie and do not the truth. And do not the truth. By the grace of God, we will do the truth in Jesus' name. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light, 
as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And the Lord will help us. In the name of Jesus. In fellowship, we submit to one another. We submit to one another. Whether fellowship in the home, again, back to the family, the wife submits unto the husband. The husband submit to the wife. The children submit to parents. The parents submit to children. But understand, even though I say parents submit to children, husband submit to wife, everything has their level and limits. So that nobody says, well, whatever I have said, I have said. Right or wrong, I have said it. No, that's not the way it works. When you are wrong, you admit you are wrong. You acknowledge and admit your fault and correct the wrong in the family. Sometimes daddy can be wrong, mommy can be wrong, and then we don't get so proud that we cannot tell our children, oh, I am sorry. That's the submission. But then, at the same time, it is the same to him, son, do this, do that. Don't go here, don't go there. Understand, if your parents tell you not to do something, they have passed your stage before. They've been through it before. They know more than what you know. They may not be able to give you all the reasons why they have to tell you no. But once they say it, respect your parents. The same thing in the church. The leadership of the church may not be able to come out and say, this is why we are taking this step and this, uh, making this decision. But understand that they have been doing this work for a while and they know more than you know. They have more information that, than you do. They see more than you do. They hear more than you do. Submit unto them. I said submit unto them. I said submit unto them. And the Lord will help us all together in Jesus' name. So that as a member together within the body of Christ, we maintain the sanctity of the fellowship and the sanctity of worship together. We fellowship with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We worship the Godhead without any limitation, without any uh, restriction. And then we fellowship with one another. We also honor one another. We submit to one another. Hebrews chapter 13, I'm looking at verse uh, 7. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember them that have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Remember them that have the rule over you. Please pay attention. Not remember them that you have rule over. The leadership in the church is not to be controlled by the congregation. The church of God is not to be run or ruled by committee, but by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And there are times you may not agree with what the leader is doing. As long as the leader is not committing sin, just like we say in the family. As long as your daddy or your mommy, as long as your husband is not, your husband is not telling you to do anything that is sinful, the Bible says, obey your husband in all things. Obey your parents in the Lord. And the Lord will give us the grace in Jesus' name. And so it says there in that verse 7, remember them. Remember them. Remember how you talk to them. Remember how you relate with them. Remember how you uh, judge what they do. Remember them that have the rule over you. Who has spoken unto you the word of God, not their own word. Not their own world. Not scheming for themselves. Not planning for themselves. Not preparing the ground for themselves. But the word of the Lord. And the work of God. Whose faith follow. When the Bible says whose faith follow. We look at their life. We can see godliness. We look at their life. We can see righteousness. We look at, at their life. We can see humility. We look at their life. We can see heaven coming down into their soul. We look at their life. We can see real divine spiritual leadership. We look at their life and we can see God is doing this to them. God is doing that to them. He says who faith follow. Considering the end of their conversation. Verse 17. The same chapter. Hebrews 13, 17. It says, obey them. Somebody say, obey. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves 
for the watch for your soul, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable unto you. Obey them, not chastising them, not rebuking them, not insulting them, not backbiting them, not destroying what they are building. Obey them that have the rule over you. And God will give us the grace in Jesus' name. The great, st the great strength of the local church is its Christian community. The Christian community life that we live. Not just the social community life. No, but the Christian community life. All learn from one another. We all draw strength from one another. And then we all grow together in the faith. Uh, under spirit Field ministry of the leading uh, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, fellowship is having a common relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Before I let this go, what then are the things that we should do in fellowship and in worship? Number one, every Christian fellowship should lead to conversion of soul. Anything we do, everything should do, should lead to somebody saying, Lord, I am making right my way. I am making right my life, and they will give us the grace in Jesus' name. Every fellowship you need to confirming, combating, confirming one another, confirming one another. It should lead to complementing the effort and the labor of one another, not uh, working against one another. It should lead to compelling everybody to live for God and the glory of God. That is the purpose of true fellowship. It should lead to comforting one another. It should lead to correcting one another. Our real fellowship and true fellowship should lead to commitment and consecration to the Lord and the things of the Lord and committing ourselves to one another. It should lead to confessing our fault to one to another. Confessing our fault one to another. When somebody is proud, you have done something wrong. And despite all effort to get you to come to, to reasoning, and you think, I am the Almighty. Nobody can correct me. Something is wrong. You are spiritually dead. Confessing one to another. Fellowship through fellowship should lead us to keeping company with one another, company with one another. It should lead to contacting one another. That means you are not just an entity on your own. You are not just an island on your own. You have contact with other believers, relationship with other believers that edifies, relationship that admonishes, relationship that lifts up, not something that dampens the spirit, not that alone. Through fellowship leads to compliance, compliance with uh, the rules and regulations within the body. That is a true fellowship in the church. We work together, we collaborate together, and then we cooperate together. Not that alone. True fellowship should lead to conflict resolution. There are issues in the church. You are not taking side with anybody. You want to see how everything will be resolved, conflict resolution. It should lead to consistency in the faith, consistency in fellowship, consistency in our commitment and consecration. I told you earlier on, it should lead to catering for one another. We supply the need of one another. That's what we read in Acts chapter 2 over there. And then there will be communication with one another. Nobody is left in the dark. And then there's conformity to the uh, rules and regulation of the church. What do we avoid in fellowship? We avoid competition. Avoid competition within the church. Avoid complaining and grumbling. Avoid conflict. And please understand that every human being will be remembered either, either for the trouble they have to create or the problem they have to solve. What will your life be remembered for? And everything we do, we shall be remembered. Amen. True fellowship should not involve conspiracy in any way or form. Not conspiring against anybody. Not conspiring against members of the church or members uh, or leaders in your, uh, in your section. It should not involve condemnation. But rather make your contribution. It should, it should not lead to concession. The word conceit there is pride. Some people, they are proud because of their position. They are proud because of their power. They are proud because of their beauty. They are proud because of title, because of whatsoever. Concession. They are, uh, so conceit also is not just about pride, but self-serving. Selfishness and self-centered. 
Everybody must see me. Everybody must honor me. I must make myself look like I'm better than everybody, holier than thou attitude. That is carnality. It is not of God. And then we don't do comparison in true fellowship. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Finally, I get to maturing the believers, maturity of believers, maturity of believers. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4. I look at it from verses 11 to 15. Ephesians chapter 4. Understand we are looking at the church. The mission and the ministry of the church. Of the church. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. It says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and preachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till there is a purpose. We all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. God will make us perfect. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Of fullness of Christ. Verse 14. That we henceforth be no more who? Children. Tossed to and fro. And carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men and corny craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, to deceive. Some will come to you like a, uh, uh, like a sheep, but in reality, they are revenant wolf. They come in sheep's clothing, but they are revenant wolf. They want to get your attention. They want to distract you. They want to deprive you of the gift and the grace and the, and the goodness of God in your life. Verse 15. But speaking what? Are you not there? Can you say it? Let me hear you. One more time. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head evil Christ. That is the maturity we are talking about, and the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. The Bible speaks of growth and maturity in and by the means of prayer. Through the word of God and the exercise of faith, through patience in testing, patience in love, patience in grace, patience in Christian work, patience in spiritual gift. As you matured, are you a mature believer? Can you really, really say that you are growing in grace? Can you say your life is better than what it used to be? Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That is the purpose of the church. That we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And that's why we warm the saint. And we warm the sinner. But you know, some people will come again and confront the leadership. Why are you preaching like that as if we are all sinners? Uh-uh. The Bible says we should warn every man. Look at it again. Whom we preach. Warning every man. Every man. And teaching every man. Whether you're a saint or you're a sinner. Teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Perfect in Christ. You see some attitude in the church, some behaviors in the church, and when you see some people doing some things, you'll be surprised because you, you, you will think, these people have been in the church for so long. They're supposed to know better. Understand, being in the church for so long is not spirituality. You have to really get yourself spiritually matured in the faith before you can get to that level. Uh, acting somehow, behaving somehow, talking somehow, it's not spirituality. You have to be sure that by the grace of God, you really have that. And all this will be tested by your patience, by your love, by the grace of God, by your Christian work, by your devotion, by your commitment, by your relationship with one another. And the Lord will help us and keep us to the end in Jesus' name. Second Peter is where I'm looking at chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, uh, the 18th verse over there. Second Peter 
chapter 3, verse 18. There the Bible says, um, but grow in grace. You will grow in grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. And the church says, Amen. 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 You will grow in grace. I say you grow in grace. But understand to be a member of the fellowship, to be a member of the church, the church of Christ, the redeemed church of Christ, uh, the saved church of Christ, the transformed church of Christ, understand you must be born again. If you are not born again, it doesn't matter how many Bible you know. It doesn't matter how long you pray. It doesn't matter how much you pass. At the end of it all, you will regret all through eternity. Let us pray. How is your life? Can heaven look at you and consider you a member of the church? I'm not saying a member of deeper life. Deeper life is just a name on earth. A member of the church. Saved. Transformed. Renewed. Restored. A member of the church. The church of which Jesus is the pastor. The head and the leader. Are you a member of the church? If you're a member of that church, that church is a family. You don't seek the evil of the church. You don't walk against the church. You don't carry bad news about the church. You don't do things that will negate the effort of the leaders in the church. And you don't take information, negative information, false information from one country to another country. You are doing the work of the devil for him. Be a child of God. Even God said, come now, let us reason together. If you think you are saved, think again. Let him that thinketh is there, take heed, lest he fall. This is a new year. It should be a life, a year with a new life. Are you doing the work of the ministry, the preaching of the gospel? Or your duty is gossip and backbiting? How many souls have you brought to Christ? How many souls are you maturing in the faith? Are you a soul winner or you are a soul loser? Souls that others have labored on. Planted and watered. You are losing them. You are scattering them. You are weakening their hearts. And leaders that are laboring. In those small fellowships, the big fellowship, In those departments. All their labor. You don't see anything good in it. Of what spirit are you? Now it's is the accepted time. Now is the accepted time. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. Humble themselves. Repent of their evil ways and then call upon my name. He said he will hear from heaven. He will heal our land. Our land must be healed. Our hearts must be healed. Our church must be healed. Our families must be healed. Our finances must be healed. I will heal their land. Talk to God. Talk to God. Talk to God. Are you ministering to the saints? Are you supporting the, the saints? 
are you complementing their effort and labor? Or you are making them to labor with grief and with sorrow? Are you praying for them? Are you praying for them? The leaders in the family? The leaders in the church? Even the leaders in our nation? All you do is looking for their fault. Your adversary is there looking for your fault. Let's be a blessing to one another. We have a spiritual calling. This is a church. It's not a political environment. It's not a social gathering. It's not a professional gathering or business, business meeting. This is the church of Jesus Christ. The congregation of the saints. Jesus comes to reward his servant. Whether I be known or nigh, will you find you and I waiting, watching for the coming of the Lord? Mm -hmm.